Hello and welcome once again to The Blueprints. This is Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Kawartha, Lakes, Brock, with new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We ask that you like, subscribe, comment, share this program. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. Of course, if you can't listen or watch it in its entirety right this second, download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it is out there. We've got another great show for you today. We're going to follow up on what we talked about last week with Raquel Dancho, the Member of Parliament for Kildonan St. Paul, also the public safety critic for His Majesty's loyal opposition, and that was the Emergencies Act. Was or is the bar met to have the government invoke the Emergencies Act on the convoy in Ottawa just a few months ago. And to continue that conversation, we have a good friend of the show, Dane Loy, the Member of Parliament for Sturgeon River Parkland. He's also the Emergency Preparedness Critic. Thank you very much for coming back. Well, thank you for having me, Jamie. Lots more things happened uh, a week ago. In in one week, we have got a lot more information. And let's start with the one that's kind of hitting the headlines. We talked about this week in question period even. It's the fact that through the whole thing, Bill Blair, the Emergency Preparedness Minister, and one time the public safety minister said uh, there was no poli- the government uh, interference inside the the whole process nothing but then you start getting more and more testimony that's coming out that's saying yeah you know what there there doesn't seem the bar not being hit right the the there the the ambassador bridge was cleared coots alberta was cleared your working committee no firearms that were claimed to be in Ottawa were found, were seized. Uh, it just keeps unraveling that the bar had not been met. Well, yeah, and I think um, we're also talking about two different things here. So well, ye- yeah. yesterday in question period, uh, we were talking about recent audio recordings that had revealed that that. an April 28th meeting with RCB Commissioner Lucky and her subordinates, where she quite clearly said that the minister's office had requested that they release confidential evidence about the ongoing Nova Scotia mass shooting investigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to remember that the minister, and she also said the minister was involved, she was talking with the minister about this, it was a request from the minister. Uh, And yet, you know, all during the summer, before this audio recording was revealed, the minister and the commissioner all claimed that there was no political interference of any kind, there was no attempt to interfere in the RCMP communications. Um, But the audio recording says otherwise. So we're fighting to get to the bottom of this. But it also, you know, comes back to what we're talking about with the Emergencies Act. Uh, We've seen from the government that, you know, they've been playing fast and loose with the truth. Uh, We were told when the Emergencies Act was uh, invoked that it was law enforcement that had asked the government to do this. But lo and behold, as we ask uh, law enforcement everywhere from Parliamentary Protective Service, the Ottawa Police, the OPP, all the way up to the RCMP, none of them will actually admit Uh, In fact, none of them have said that they asked the government to invoke the Emergencies Act. And just this week, we have further evidence uh, of confidential evidence that just came to light that RCMP Commissioner Lucky, uh, on the day I believe the Emergencies Act was invoked, told the Minister of Public Safety that they had not exhausted all of the avenues, all of the legal tools and authorities that they had available to deal with the protests. And so we all know that one of the justifications that needs to be fulfilled before invoking the Emergencies Act is the government has to prove that there were no other powers or authorities available, uh, no tools in the toolbox available before invoking the Act. When the RCMP commissioner is saying there were still tools in the toolbox that hadn't been used, it's blowing a big hole in the government's argument for invoking the Emergencies Act. Absolutely, considering we were told that public safety was at risk, that all these things, the, the, there was that one time, they, I remember in the media reading that there was Russian interference and, and dark money coming to fund the protesters, and all that has so far turned out to be uh, false. Well, I think, you know, this is a case, I think the government was uh, in, a, in a black spin. Uh, they didn't know what to do. They were going to throw as much mud at the wall as they could and hope something stuck. Um, so we were hearing everything from there was possibility that the Russians were funding the convoy, uh, which the CBC actually had to apologize for uh, airing uh, that you know suggestion that that had happened. Um, we've seen uh, allegations that there were firearms in the protest, an allegation that has never been proven. Uh, we had members of the government and members of the NDP standing up in the House and claiming that convoy protesters tried to burn down a building full of residents in downtown Ottawa. The OPP came out later and said, no, these two people had no connection to the convoy protests. It had nothing to do with the convoy protests. And so the more we look into this, the more we realize that there is a tremendous amount of misinformation uh, that this government has been pumping on this issue. 
And I don't think this commission uh, report is going to look very favorably on the federal government. So the, the committee, is the committee still looking into the, the, uh, the Emergencies Act? I know there's the inquiry, but also mm -hmm. the committee, you said, is doing some work. Well, there's really a two-track process here that was set up under the legislation. And, you know, you have to remember this legislation was set up as an accountability mechanism mm -hmm. to ensure that governments did not abuse Canadian civil liberties in national security situations. And so the act is working as it should be. We have the committee track, which is made up of parliamentarians, which is currently uh, doing an open review. And then we have the uh, committee of inquiry headed by Justice Rouleau that's also doing important work. And, and I believe that both of these committees have an essential function in our democracy. Um, rebuilding trust in our institutions is so important because we've seen how the Liberals have wrecked uh, Canadians' trust in the institutions because of what we believe to be their abuse of the Emergencies Act. And so uh, part of this process is about rebuilding trust, showing transparency, showing accountability. And we need the government to reveal uh, all the documents, uh, all the cabinet documents. And, and as we see this evidence, I think Canadians can, can start to rebuild their confidence in, uh, in government, not talking about partisan government, but just government in general, because I frankly don't have a lot of confidence or if any confidence in this Liberal government that they had any evidence to justify the use of the emergencies. It certainly doesn't look like it as we're following this along. So, and just to clarify for those listening and watching, the, the inquiry has a, a little different powers than the, the committee does as well. The, the inquiry can go a, a dig a little deeper, so to speak, without the, the political non answers. Yeah, and you know, something that's frustrating about the parliamentary committee, but you know, it's an essential, uh, it's an essential function of the committee is that it's made up of uh, membership from all parties and senators. And so you're going to get that back and forth and debate and you're going to get parliamentarians from different perspectives trying to get their perspectives on the agenda, trying to prove their point. Uh, one thing I like about having the Commission of Inquiry though is we have somebody who has been given a great deal of power to compel witnesses, to compel evidence. There is less of the back and forth debating in the parliamentary and political theatre. And so I think they both have an important role to play, uh, but I'm very interested to see uh, some of the evidence that's coming out from this commission. And something I guess we could, should mention as well, we did last week, is to basically say right now what we're trying to figure out in the inquiry and the standing committee is whether or not that bar has been met. Was there enough information? Was national security, safety of the country at risk in order to invoke the Emergencies Act? So far, my opinion, I don't think it has. I know some media are saying it hasn't either. But at the same time, there are people who are angry with the convoy, the people living in Ottawa who, mm. who had their lives disrupted, their roads blocked, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, regardless of how you feel about that, it still goes back to the main point, was the standard met? Yeah. And I'm not going to try to make the argument that there was no threat to public safety. I think certainly when you have a large group of people that are upset about something, you know, there's always a possibility that, um, you know, there could be an outbreak of, of uh, violence, uh, you know, maybe some, some elements going in there that, uh, that, you know, could have posed a threat. But we deal with public safety threats all the time in Canada, and it doesn't require invoking an Emergencies Act that froze people's bank accounts, that... Uh, prevented people from moving freely uh, in the city that um, basically allowed the government to um, mass arrest people uh, in that situation. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we have public safety issues in this country. There are legal tools available to law enforcement and uh, the evidence is showing that they didn't use all the tools available to them. Um, and, and so I don't think the Emergencies Act uh, uh, threshold was met. Well, hopefully Canadians are watching this. The, the other thing I want to talk about was something I said off the beginning, and then I kind of went on two different trails. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your patience in this. So the other part is what happened in Nova Scotia. There was mm -hmm. Canada's worst mass shooting. Um, too many people lost their lives too young. And we were told there was no government interference in the police investigation. It turns out through notes... Uh, that were made public, notepads from uh, pretty high-ranking members backed up by other members that were in meetings with uh, the, the commissioner, um, that it, it seems that there was some, at least gives the impression that political interference was happening in order for the Liberals to gain traction to bring in their firearms legislation. Well, yes, I think, you know, it was very unbecoming of the government in the days after the mass shooting to be thinking to themselves, how can we leverage this uh, to uh, help our pending gun control announcement? And going to the commissioner of the RCMP and requesting that certain information be revealed to the public so that it could assist the government in this political announcement, I think is, is a very dangerous precedent that's being set. Um, 
And we questioned the government about this based on the notes from Superintendent Campbell, which said that promises, the, the commissioner claimed that she had made promises to the government, that she had received requests from the minister as in the minister's office to release this information. And the commissioner said, no, no promise was made. The, the minister has said that there was no interference of any kind. That's pretty unequivocal when you're saying no interference of any kind. And, and yet the minister could have just been straightforward with us back in June and said, yes, we did make a request uh, to the RCMP that this information be shared because we thought it was important information that Canadians would want to know about. Um, we know from the commissioner's audio recordings that the request did come from the minister's office. So it's curious to me why they're trying to try to hide this. Um, so either the commissioner is lying, she was telling her subordinates that a promise was made, that a request was made that had never happened, or the minister is lying and saying that there was no interference. And, there, you know, there can't be, both can't be true. And so we got to fight to get to, to the bottom of this. Absolutely. And, and this is just extremely frustrating that how the Liberals seem to handle this kind of situation. You have a tragedy. You have mm. Canadians in mourning. And as you said, they're thinking about how they're going to leverage it in order to to advance their political agenda and then to to kind of pawn it off as no we had nothing to do with it and i think if it wasn't for this audio recording some of the media might have shrugged too and, and just moved on as well well you know i think what the liberals uh, uh, are good at is they just try to like slow pace these stories and then just hope that the media and the opposition loses interest and that it goes away and you know we had the notes of superintendent campbell versus the word of the minister and the commissioner but these audio tapes back up what Superintendent absolutely. Campbell was saying. Yes, and absolutely. we have to remember that these audio tapes were partially destroyed. These are partially destroyed audio tapes. So there is audio out there, or could have been audio out there that would have said far more about the situation. But because the audio was partially destroyed, uh, we will never know the full story from the audio side. So we have to rely on the notes of Superintendent Campbell and the audio that we have uh, to draw conclusions. And I think the very clear conclusion that I draw is that there was far more involvement of the minister's office and the minister himself than they led on back in June. And potentially the prime minister. I believe uh, Commissioner Lucky said something about having to call the prime minister or at least the prime minister's office and give a report, which is quite telling as well. Well, the prime minister was involved as well. Certainly if Commissioner Lucky is to believe, be believed on her audio call that she was in uh, regular communication with the Prime Minister and you know there's nothing inappropriate about a uh, Prime Minister or a Minister keeping up to date sharing information. Sure. Especially in tragedy like that. Of course uh, we would expect that of our leaders that they would be involved but to have uh, ministers offices and ministers and prime ministers attempting to micromanage the communication strategy uh, a communication strategy that could jeopardize an open investigation and we have to realize the reason why they RCMP didn't want to reveal the nature Very of the important. firearms involved was because there was firearms that were traced to the United States. Firearms that were traced to somebody in the United States and they needed to figure out how that person in the United States got the firearms over the border and into the hands of this mass That's killer. Right. And if those firearms had been revealed to the public, it could have jeopardized that investigation, a cross-border investigation with the FBI, and, and we could not allow that for that to happen. So the ultimate justice for families is to ensure that those responsible, everyone responsible for these deaths is held accountable. And, uh, you know, attempting to jeopardize and invest, allowing a, an investigation to get jeopardized to make political points is not justice for these families. And now we learned Latin, last week, last Friday, a few days ago, that it's now illegal to sell, transfer, buy a handgun in Canada. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, this Liberal government is uh, big on symbolism, although this is having a, a massive impact on firearms, legal firearm owners in Canada. But, you know, I was looking at the news over the weekend and this handgun freeze didn't do anything to stop uh, the shootings that we've seen in our cities, uh, shootings that are carried out by, you know, predominantly gang members, uh, predominantly hardened criminals who are using illegally, well, smuggled handguns coming mm -hmm. in from the United States. Um, so we see with this gun freeze that the government's put in, it's having a huge impact on legal firearms owners, but it's having absolutely no impact on the real problem, which is the hardened criminals that are using firearms on our streets. All right, I think we're going to pick up that topic next week, talking about public safety, talk about illegal firearms and, and shootings in our, in our cities and the increased rate of crime. People are feeling less safe across Canada. I think we're going to pick up on that next week. As you know, Dane, I always give the guests the last words, so the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come. Uh, I really appreciate your podcast and the work that you're doing to uh, keep Canadians informed on what's going on. So thank you for having me again.
All right, Jane Lloyd, Member of Parliament for Sturgeon River Parkland in the beautiful province of Alberta. Also, the emergency preparedness critic. He's doing a great job. Watch his committee work on his social media. He is really lighting it up and bringing some of these issues into the forefront and, and into the media stream. So we do appreciate him and we appreciate you for joining us here today. Please like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Of course, we have new content for you every single Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you can't watch or listen to it, download it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it. It's out there. Tell your friends about it because they have two friends that might be interested in as well. Until then, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint.